this video is about how the pancreas, the liver, and the duodenum work together. Pancreas, liver, and duodenum work together. Oops, work together. And the purpose of them working together is for chemical digestion and then modification or transport of nutrients. So let's get started looking at this. All right, so um, this right here, this part right here is the duodenum. This is the first curve of the small intestine. So the stomach is kind of up here, over, over this way, not shown on this picture. And let's um, just go ahead and highlight this duodenum in with an orange highlighter, like this. And it gets its name historically uh, because it means like 12 fingers, duodenum. And in fact, that's how a lot of people pronounce it is duodenum. But I think more people say duodenum. So it literally means 12 fingers because that's as long as it was. It was like 12 fingers long, so 10 of fingers and then two more is about the length of it. And you can see that it curves like this and it has a cozy relationship with the pancreas. So let's use a blue highlighter to put the pancreas on here. Uh, right like this. And the pancreas is super squishy. It is um, almost all made of epithelial tissue, and rips kind of easily. I think of it as like cottage cheesy in structure. So in blue here, this is the pancreas. And this structure right here is the pancreatic duct. So all of the stuff that the pancreas is making can go zoom down into the duodenum. So this is where the stuff that it makes enters the duodenum down the duct. And what is it making? Well, first of all, the pancreas is making uh, bicarbonate. This is basically like baking soda. And just like that, it is meant to make the chyme that's coming from the, the stomach more basic. So its job is to neutralize acidic chyme after food leaves the stomach, the, or when it, it reaches in the stomach, the chyme reaches a pH of 2, which is very, very low pH. And so when that chyme comes into the duodenum, if it didn't get neutralized, the duodenum can't protect itself as easily from acid as stomach can. And so the acid would literally rip up the duodenum and cause duodenal ulcers. And some people do struggle with that problem. But under uh, in a healthy situation, then the bicarbonate will neutralize the acidic chyme from two all the way up to a more basic pH of eight. So this prevents ulcers, but it also has another really cool and really exciting function. In the stomach, we talked about how um, pepsinogen is not activated until it's around acid, and then it's able to start breaking down proteins. Well, the duodenum enzymes work the other way. They can only be active at a neutral pH. So this um, bicarbonate acts to activate the pancreatic enzymes. And those enzymes generally fall into the category uh, amylase or similar types, and those break down carbohydrates down into sugars. Uh, lipase breaks down lipids or fats down into fatty acids and glycerol. And then there's a whole bunch of different kind of proteases that break down different combinations of amino acids so that a long protein can be broken down into its component amino acids. Now all of these are considered exocrine
products because they're secreted onto um, a mucous membrane or onto a membrane. So they come out here and they're secreted here. The pancreas also makes insulin. That goes into the bloodstream, so it's considered an endocrine product. It's a hormone. So let's put that next. So we've got the bicarbonate. We've got uh, pancreatic enzymes, another thing that's coming out. And then in a whole different category, because it's not going into the duodenum at all, but insulin and glucagon too, but we don't talk about that one as much. Um, insulin will be secreted into the blood. So this is considered an endocrine product because it's a hormone and it's going into the blood. So for that reason, the pancreas is actually an endocrine and an exocrine gland. And it makes sense that insulin would be secreted though at the same time that a meal containing carbohydrates enters the duodenum because all of these simple sugars are going to go into the bloodstream and they're going to raise blood sugar. And what is the job of insulin? Well, it's going to lower blood sugar. So sometimes I call, well, most of the time I call insulin a storage hormone for that reason. Okay, yeah, this is a fun page of notes. So now let's go back up here and kind of remember what, what were we doing? Look, looking at the pancreas and its role um, in helping uh, food be broken down. So these enzymes come into the duodenum and in this area right here, about 80% of the chemical digestion occurs and a bunch of absorption actually occurs too. Even though the small intestine is very long, most of the work gets done in the first couple of feet of it. So now we also have to think about the action of lipase. Lipase breaks down fat, but it can't do it until the fat has been broken up into droplets. So now let's get a green highlighter and color the gallbladder green. Believe it or not, the gallbladder actually is green. Oh, I remember something else I had wanted to tell you when we were talking over here about bicarbonate coming out of the pancreas. So if you have a bunch of bicarbonate in here and then a person has chronic diarrhea, 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 they lose a lot of bicarbonate from their body and the body can actually become too acidic. And so for that reason, someone's blood can become too acidic if they've had um, chronic diarrhea for a while. It can be a problem in like, for example, cholera and other um, really bad diarrheal diseases. Okay, so this is the gallbladder and we'll write that in um, green. And it has two jobs. It stores the bile, but it also concentrates it. Notice it doesn't make it. It stores it and it concentrates it. And if it concentrates it too much, guess what? You get gallstones. So the bile is actually produced by the liver. And this is the liver right here. So the liver produces the bile and then bile goes down the hepatic duct right here. So I'm going to use the yellow highlighter on that. Hepatic means liver, so this is the hepatic duct. The bile comes down the hepatic duct and if, um, if you're right in the middle of a meal, it can just continue right on down the bile duct and go into the duodenum. But if you're in between meals or it's more bile than is needed for that meal, then what can happen is that the bile can actually be pushed back up 
in be, to be stored in the gallbladder. And that, this structure right here is the cystic duct. And that word cyst kind of refers to the ball-like structure of the gallbladder. So to go over this again, we have three different duct names you have to learn. The hepatic duct is where the bile produced by the liver first flows. And then it has two choices. It can either go down the bile duct and straight into the duodenum, or the smooth muscle around the cystic duct can actually squeeze it back up and into the gallbladder. And then when you eat a meal that has fat in it, the smooth muscle squeezes the other way, isn't that amazing? And pushes the bile down into the duodenum. And then what is the purpose of this great bile? Let's write that in green. So the purpose of bile is to break fat into smaller droplets. that lipase can act on. So if you have lipase, but you don't have enough bile, you actually can't um, break down the fats in your diet very completely. And you could end up with fat in the stool, and that can be a sign of liver problems. If there's um, if like fatty streaks in the feces, they should not be there. A fancier word for what bile actually does is uh, called emulsifier. And emulsifier is what I just defined right there. It breaks the fat into smaller droplets so that the lipase can attack the fat from all sides of it, more surface area, and break it down into fatty acids and glycerol. Okay, so now let's talk just a little bit about what happens in the liver once um, the sugars and the amino acids are broken down and absorbed into the bloodstream. What they do is they go straight from the blood vessels of the duodenum to the liver through a vein called the hepatic portal vein. I made that in purple. It's important it's purple. It's not red or blue like an artery or a vein. It's purple because it is very special. It's called the hepatic portal vein. And the words all mean something important. Hepatic means that it has to do with the liver. Portal means it's a doorway between two organs, basically between the small intestine and the liver. And vein means it's going back toward the heart. So it's not going to be oxygenated, it's going to be deoxygenated. But what is really interesting is because it's a portal vein and it, the blood that is draining from the small intestine goes to the liver, it is full of nutrients after a meal. So it drains blood from the small intestine And so that means after a meal, there's going to be tons of glucose, tons of amino acids here. Now notice I didn't mention the fats, and that's because the fats from the meal actually go into our lymphatic system and then join up with the blood vessels near the heart. So they go on a different path and they're not modified directly by the liver. So over here in pink, you can put the hepatic artery and this is where the liver gets its oxygenated blood from. This is the hepatic artery. And so that's going to have oxygen in it for the liver. It will also have whatever glucose happens to be in the blood at that time. But after a meal, the hepatic portal vein might very well have very high amounts of glucose. And we can't just let those back out into the blood or someone would have really high blood sugar. So let's put the hepatic vein right here. And notice I made it in blue like a traditional vein. It's heading back to the heart 
but it is going to contain modified levels. So mod, mod for modified levels of sugar and amino acids. So that the blood doesn't just get blasted with whatever sugar might have been in the meal that you just ate. Okay, so now what happens if there's too much sugar coming through the liver and our body knows it's going to be over 100 milligrams for deciliter, which would be too much sugar or uh, maybe above 150 or something. Well, if there's too much, let's see, let's just use a black pen for this. So excess glucose from the hepatic portal vein will be stored. Sorry, it went a little blurry on me. Then we'll use this fancy word right here, glycogenesis. And even lipogenesis. If you have a bunch of excess sugar, you can actually store it in the liver. And in fact, if the situation gets bad enough, then that can lead to what's known as fatty liver disease. But what if there's not enough glucose? Because then you're going to pass out, right? What if you're between meals and there isn't very much glucose coming in through the hepatic portal vein? Now what? The liver still saves the day. It can perform glycogenolysis to break down the stored sugar. It can perform lipolysis to break down the stored sugar, and it can even perform another process called gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. And this process can make sugar from fatty acids and from amino acids. So it can break down fats and proteins or use those to make new glucose. So again, if you just ate a meal and there's a lot of sugar coming into the liver, your liver will store the excess as glycogen or it will store the excess as fat. If there's not very much glucose coming into the liver, then the liver still has to make sure you have enough blood sugar so you don't pass out. So then it can break down the glycogen in a process called glycogenolysis. It can break down the fat in a process called lipolysis, and it can make new glucose from fatty acids and, or like actually glycerol and amino acids.